I'm doing this particular video to show that much of what is happening now was set up and known about long ago, which I'm sure a lot of people who are into figuring things out are aware of, but I just want people to be aware of this particular book, which was written in 1895 by a chemist, John Uri Lloyd, uh, who's from Cincinnati, Ohio, and he was not a writer other than a couple of books he wrote afterwards, uh, reminiscing his youth. And uh, But this is his major literary contribution, and it came out of nowhere. It's a, basically a hyper-intellectual uh, Jules Verne. It was written uh, in 1895, and they don't talk about it directly, but it is about William Morgan, who supposedly betrayed the Masons by revealing their rituals and secret oaths and he was killed by them for it apparently but this book proposes that he was just portraying that he actually did this but he was shown deeper mysteries by going into the interior of the earth various cavities going lower and lower until he reaches this sort of very gnostic ultimate uh, point at edadorpa is uh, aphrodite spelled backwards so, you know, take that for what it is. The whole anti-Masonic movement lasted from 1826, really, to 1836. It's very big in any history of Freemasonry. If you've looked into their own documents, they, you know, they talk about it as a bad event, but they really get into it as what happened, the official story anyways. John Uri Lloyd was a Freemason, and the people he associated with Freemasons. His, uh, the illustrator of the book, J. Augustus Knapp was a Freemason. He worked with later on with Manly P. Hall, writing, well, illustrating his uh, book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and his tarot cards. So that's one association we can make right there. But so we're talking about a, a Freemason, and he says he was given permission to write this book. This book, to me, sounds wherever it's coming from, it's coming from the highest official Masonic sources, and. There's some things I want to read to you from the book to make it clearer. But before I do that, I want to show this letter that was written concerning John Uri Lloyd. And it seems to be about from this time period of 1936. And it talks about Edda Dorpa and Morgan's history. It gets into the official history of Morgan, but it starts off by saying it looks like that this is a book. Part of Morgan's history is blank. I would say in the book. Edadorpa, but following is from McKay's History of Freemasonry. McKay is a famous historian of Freemasonry. So it sort of goes over the official narrative here. You know, where he was born, which is Culpeper County, Virginia. He's a stonecutter, literally a mason <laughs> when he grew up. So one of the things I want to talk about here, or show that he's written, is that Scientists, he claims that scientists are the main part of the Brotherhood and that they've learned how to extend life. So they work through generations and they conceal from the Freemasons and other people, other groups, who they are and the true purposes of the bro Brotherhood, which are becoming more and more evident these days for any anyone who is part of the Brotherhood and just awakens to what the F they're in, and the rest of us who are free to look into it. Uh, so, yes, they have moved here and there through all orders of society, and their attainments are unknown except to one another, or at most but a few persons. These adepts are scientific men, and they may not even be recognized as members of our organization. Indeed, it is often necessary for obvious reasons that they should not be known as such. These studies must be constantly prosecuted in various directions, and some monitors must teach others to perform certain duties that are necessary to the grand evolution. So, he's talking about passing through the caverns here, and how he, each cavern is, is different, each layer is different within the earth. And as, as you know, I, I, you know, humans aren't supposed to be in these levels of the earth if they exist. You know, we're not... It's not really something we should be... We're get, you're getting closer and closer to the place. It's not great for humans. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, but, it would appear that they are there. And, it's edible. He takes this uh, mushroom, 
and it sends him into the depths of hell. <laughs> it really does. And he thinks he's there for so long, like an eternity. And then he comes back and he's in the same place. And the John Uri Lloyd and his brothers uh, collected uh, mushrooms from all over the world. I, I don't think this is a book about a drug trip. Uh, it, it contains one, but I don't think that this is what this book is about. Some people have tried to make it seem like that. And uh, one of the things about this, uh, he's in this chamber with all these mushrooms, <clears throat> and they're in this, it's a uh, place where the atmosphere of that cavern is just right for the growth of mushrooms, and they're not like the, uh, the mushrooms on the surface. They're wonderful, they taste great, they taste like, you know, fruit. And so, like, this is a, kind of a key phrase right here. These meandering caverns comprise thousands of miles of surface covered by these growths, which may yet fulfill a grand purpose in the ceremony of nature, for they are destined to feed the tramping multitudes when the day appears in which the nations of men will desert the surface of the earth and pass as a single people through these caverns on their way to the immaculate existence to be found in the inner sphere. So that doesn't sound good right there. We have these crystal caves in Mexico. Something else he gets into is that by uh, manipulating the flicker rate and looking, I think, upwards, the way he describes it, you can see to the interior of your brain. And that this is being described to the narrator. The narrator is not the person who's traveled to the interior of the earth. And so the guy is saying that through a certain mechanism, you can look at the interior of the brain not only like physically, as they show it here, but that you can you will actually be able to see the imagery on the brain and that and project it outwards. And so that people it, it talks basically <laughs> something that's only you know in the past 20, 30 years maybe has been considered a possible reality is being able to see what is on someone's mind. And back then they're talking about physically watching you think the visual impressions that are going on in your mind. No, you've seen but a small portion of the brain convolutions, only those that lie directly back of the optic nerve. By systematic research, under proper conditions, every part of the living brain may become as plainly pictured as that which you have seen. And is that all that could be learned, I, I asked? No, he continued. Further development may enable man, men to picture the figures engraved on the convolutions, and at last to read the thoughts that are engraved with, within the brains of others. And thus, through material investigation, the observer will perceive the recorded thought of another person. An instrument capable of searching and illuminating the retina could easily be affixed to the eye of a criminal, after which, if the mind of the person operated upon were stimulated by the suggestion of an occurrence either remote or recent, the mind faculty would excite the brain produce the record and spread the circumstances as a picture before the observer. The brain would tell its own story, and the investigator could read the truth as recorded in the brain of the other man. A criminal subjected to such an examination could not tell an untruth or equivocate. His very brain would present itself to the observer. You make this assertion and then ask me to go no further. Yes, decidedly yes. <laughs> But of course, he's giving the suggestion. This is in 1895. He's telling this. So something else the book gets into is how Roger Bacon in the 1200s says, It is equally possible to construct cars which may be set in motion with marvelous rapidity, independently of horses or other animals. He says he declared that the ancients had done this and he believed the art might be revived. The ancients being the civilization that was destroyed before the flood or destroyed by the flood. A little something else I wanted to talk about was this statement from Edadorpa. There will be an unconscious development of new mind forces in the student of nature as the rudiments of these so-called sciences are elaborated. Step by step as the ages pass, the faculties of men will under progressive series of evolutions imperceptibly pass into higher phases until that which is even now possible with some individuals of the purified esoteric school, but which will, would seem miraculous if practiced openly at this day, will, will prove feasible to humanity generally and be found in exact accord with natural laws. 
So here's talking about, I guess what we would call uh, magic these days. You know, if you believe it's real and you know, these forces are going on, you're tapping into the demonic side to get these things done. But it reminds me of a, uh, it's a pretty bad movie, but kind of interesting. The important thing is you're still alive. You're here with me. That means there's still time. What is that? How did you do that? It's just the beginning. Well, why can't you just tell me what's going on? This is just a taste. A taste of the wonderful powers that are sleeping inside all of us. What powers? Genesis 11, 6. Once the people are one, nothing will be impossible. 